I hear you call. I am available. If you want to grow to be more like Jesus, the life disposition should be availability. And the verbal response is yes. Yes, Lord. I'm willing to follow. And if you do that, 13,000 hours plus, just at Shoreline, serving Jesus. And, and the impact that makes is powerful. We are thinking together over this, the beginning of this new year about what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What does it mean to be his disciple? The word disciple means follower. And, and, and we're discovering that what it really means is that we, we discover who Jesus is, how he lived, and then we seek to become like Jesus, to follow him, to live like him, to love like him, to serve like him. And then as we do that, to let that light of our lives shine to the world so they can see the presence and the power of Jesus. Now I want you to imagine if every follower of Jesus actually lived the way Jesus calls us to live, where we were striving for it, not perfectly, but striving toward that. What, what, what would that look like? And, and, and we see up here, these, these are seven markers that if you, look at the, if you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, the, the four accounts of the life of Jesus, and you study them closely in the New Testament, what you discover is that Jesus modeled things that we can engage in. So, so Bible engagement, to know and love and follow the Bible. That's what Christians do. Passionate prayer. Jesus did it. We should do wholehearted worship. God is worthy of worship. Jesus called us to worship. We worship him. Humble service. We're going to talk about that today. Serving the way Jesus did and shining his light in the world. Joyful generosity. Say, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And learning to give with generosity and joy in our hearts. Consistent community. Loving the family of God. Connecting with God's people. Organic outreach. Shining the light of Jesus in the world. And so here's the picture that the Apostle Paul paints for us in, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He paints this picture of this. Okay, here I am. I'm a follower of Jesus. If you're not yet a Christian, but you're investigating the Christian faith, this is a picture of what it looks like when you become a Christian. When you're following Jesus, you take one of your hands, and you reach out, and you find people who are further down the road. They've climbed higher on the mountain of faith than you. They're following Jesus, and you want to learn from them. You take their hand, and you learn from them how to study the Bible, how to pray, how to worship. How to joyfully give. You learn from other people. I've got two men in my life right now. One I spent time with this last week, Paul Cedar. He's a retired pastor. I, I, I reach out to him. I take his hand. And he helps me grow as a pastor and as a Christian, as a husband, as a dad on a regular basis. Another guy, Carl Overbeek, who I'll spend time with next week. Uh, and he'll be encouraging me. You go, Kevin, you're a grandpa. You got, your, your kids are in their 30s. You still need people to take your hand and help you grow in your faith? And here's my answer. Yes, I do. Through all my life of faith. Who do you reach out to that helps you grow in faith? And then we care for our own spiritual growth. While we let others encourage us, we also have to study the scriptures and we have to build community and we, we, we have to humbly serve and we work on those things in our own life. So if someone else is helping us, we're attending to our own spiritual growth and then we, and here's the beautiful part, we reach out to somebody else who's further back Maybe they're younger, maybe they're younger in the faith and we help them grow to love the scriptures and to learn to worship and to be in Christian community, and we help them along. It might be a, a little kid in the, in the children's ministry here. It might be a student. It might be a grandchild or, a, or your son or your daughter, but you're helping somebody else. It might be a friend who's, who's new to the Christian faith, but as someone else is helping you, you're tending to your own spiritual growth, and you're helping other people. Are your two hands occupied with somebody else helping you and you helping somebody else? And then here's the beautiful thing. That person you're helping along, you teach them to do the same for somebody else. And the Christian faith continues on. That's how it's been since the beginning. That's why the Apostle Paul, when he's writing to this young pastor, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, he says, Timothy, the things you've heard from me, the things I've taught you in the presence of many witnesses, so Paul says, I've taught you, you in turn entrust that to faithful people who will teach others. Four generations. Paul says, Timothy, I'm influencing you. Timothy, you influence yourself. You help others and teach them to teach others. That's what we do. And so, Jesus, this is our prayer. As we dive into your word today, as we think about humble service, we pray we will listen and learn how we can grow in humble service, but we will also let others inspire us and help us grow in this area of our, our spiritual lives and that we might take the hands of others and help them grow in humble service and teach them to do the same with those who follow after them. Speak to our hearts today, we pray, as we open your word. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Well, I want to begin by thinking about the staggering reality of God's servant heart and God's servant actions. We always begin with Jesus. That's what disciples do. That's what Christians do. We look at Jesus. And when you look at the life of Jesus and the way he served, it was staggering and beautiful and almost just like beyond comprehension. I mean, when Jesus came to this world, he left the glory of heaven. You talk about an act of service. That's, that's like saying, I've got, I've got business class on an international flight, all paid for, and I'm going to go sit in the very back of coach against the bathroom where it doesn't quite lean back the seat, and it smells a little bit, you know? It's like, and I'll do that willingly. We wouldn't, you wouldn't, if you paid for first class, you wouldn't do it. Jesus says, I'll leave heaven, and I'll come here to serve you. This is, this is how the Gospel of John puts it in John 1.14. The word became flesh. Jesus is the word of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Jesus left the glory of heaven, the second person of the Trinity, and came among us. That's humble service. He did it willingly. And then, through his life, he served the broken and the forgotten. In John chapter 13, we have one of the most beautiful pictures of the example of Jesus as a humble servant. This may be familiar to you. It might be new to some of you. But in John 13, beginning in verse 1, We read this account. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Jesus knew it was the right time. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. That's the love of Jesus. Verse 2. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God and was returning to God. Now put the pause button right there. If you have your Bible in front of you, just kind of put your finger right there and hold it there for a second. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God, he was returning to God. Jesus knew his power, he knew his strength, he knew where he came from, and he knew where he was going. That's why he could serve humbly. Humble service doesn't come out of this uh, pathetic unawareness. I don't know who I am or what I'm doing. When you know who you are and who's made you, then you serve out of that. So so look look at what it says. It's powerful. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God, and he was returning to God, knowing all that. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. He took on the clothing of a servant because he knew who he was. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are a child of the living God. You are saved by his grace, and heaven is your home. You serve out of that strength and that confidence. Verse 5, after that. So he, put, he takes, puts a towel around his waist like a servant would in those days. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. One by one by one by one, Jesus washes their feet. He gets to Thomas, who would doubt him. And Jesus kneels down and washes his feet. He gets to Peter, who would deny him three times in just a short time. And he kneels down. The Lord of glory kneels down. You can't wash feet standing up. Jesus kneels down and washes his feet. He gets to Judas. And we just read in the passage, Jesus already knew it was in the heart of Judas to betray him. Jesus washes his feet. The Lord of glory. And if you had been sitting at that table, he would have washed your feet too. Because that's what Jesus does. That's our Lord. That's our example. And this is the heart. This is the, this is the mission of Jesus to serve. Listen to these words from Mark chapter 10, verse 45. And when Jesus refers to the Son of Man, he's always referring to himself. It's, it's actually the most common self-designation that Jesus uses in all the Bible. So we read this. For even the Son of Man, Jesus speaking about himself, even the Son of Man, he says, even I did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus says, I came to this world, not if anyone could have come to this world and, and been served, if anyone could have come on a, you know, with, with, with a, you know, a bunch of horses pulling a giant chariot and saying, I'm in charge, I'm the boss, I'm the guy. It was Jesus. He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for us, for all who would believe, to lay his life down. And that means... That Jesus' life was all about service. Jesus came to heal the broken, 
Jesus sought out the broken. People broken emotionally. People broken physically. People broken spiritually. People broken relationally. You study the Gospels, it's all kinds of brokenness. And Jesus came to put them back together again. That's the heart of Jesus. That's humble service. Jesus came to free those in bondage. People that were just shackled in spiritual bondage. So, so deep in sin, so deep in spiritual bondage that everybody else ran away from them. Jesus went right towards them and set them free. That's the humble heart of Jesus. That's his serving. Jesus came to serve the unworthy. Those who didn't deserve it. That's everyone. But I'll tell you what, in Jesus' day, there were certain groups of people that others avoided. The religious leaders got bugged at Jesus because he would hang out with and serve people that they would never want to be around because they were the wrong kind of people. They were messed up people. They were, they were sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes. And Jesus sought out those people that everyone else avoided. When the religious leaders watched Jesus with these kind of people, they said, he can't be a prophet because if he knew what those people were like, he wouldn't want to be around them. And you know what Jesus was saying? I know exactly who those people are. I know exactly what they're like. And I love them and I came to serve them. That's the heart of Jesus. That's the heart that should begin to beat in our hearts. Jesus came to die to give us life. He came to lay his life down and to give us life. And you might think, okay, so Jesus, Jesus left the glory of heaven. He served us when he came in the incarnation. He served us when he walked on this earth. But then when he died on the cross and rose again, now he's done serving. Wrong. You know what one of the first things Jesus did after he rose? He cooked breakfast for the disciples after they were fishing. You ever had, you ever had a meal after you've been fishing all day or doing something really hard and physical all day? And just oh, the, Everything tastes delicious, right? Jesus prepares a meal for the disciples. That's the risen, read it in the gospel, the risen Lord Jesus cooking lunch. What a picture, right? Well, then he ascends to heaven. Okay, now he's done serving because now, he, now, he now, he's, now he's in heaven, right? No, the character of Jesus is service. So the resurrected Jesus, the Lord of glory, is still serving today. Listen to these words from Romans 8. In Romans 8, 34, we read this. Jesus who died... More than that, who was raised to life, now look at this, is at the right hand of God. And listen to what it says. And is also interceding for us. Jesus who died, who rose, and who ascended is at the right hand of God. What, what's he doing right now? He's interceding for you. He's praying for you. He's crying out for you. That's our Jesus. Humble servant. And, and then... If you're a Christian, and if you're already a believer, you know this is true. If you're not yet a Christian, you'll learn this. Once you become a Christian, you, the main thing in your life is, i got to become more like Jesus. Well, Jesus humbly served. You know what that means? It means it's time for me to learn to serve humbly like Jesus did. So then we look at our lives. To grow as a disciple is to increase each day in service. Just baby steps, moving forward, but learning to serve like Jesus served. This is part of our journey. This is part of our life as followers of Jesus. And Jesus was crystal clear. That yes, he served, but he did it for a reason, to teach us that we were to live our lives as humble servants. So in John chapter 13, we'll pick up where we, just after we left off, he, he, he washes their feet, he sits back at the table, and he's, he's talking with them. And in verse 12, we read this of John 13. When he, Jesus, had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. He's back at the table. Do you understand what I have done for you? Jesus asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Listen to this. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And then Jesus shows how relationships work. He says, very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. You want to find blessing? Start serving humbly. Jesus says, you call me your teacher, you call me your Lord. I served. It's like he's going, yeah, I served, you follow me. I'm your master, I'm your Lord, I'm your teacher. And we're like, I don't get it, what am I supposed to do? It's like, no, you get it. We get it, the question is, will we do it? Will we live it out? Will we follow his example? So what does a servant life look like? If you start to kind of paint a picture what does it look like to live a servant life like Jesus did? Here's just a couple thoughts. It's about where you sit. A humble servant life is about where you sit. When you walk into a room, 
There's my spot. The best spot. Boom, beeline. Some old lady's hitting there, boom, you bump her out of the way. On you go. You know. Well, well my, it's my spot. You know, is that is that? Or or and you read in the gospels how many times Jesus tells p- stories about people where they sit. It's a big deal. You walk in and you go, oh, I'm not gonna t- take the best spot for me. It's a heart change, right? What does a servant life look like? It's about noticing real needs. It's just about paying attention at your school, in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your HOA, where you, where you play golf or where you swim if you're part of a club. It's about, it's about in your social settings, in your friendship settings, wherever. It's, wherever it's, it's, it's looking and noticing, oh, there's a need. There's someone being forgotten. There's a gap right there, and I'm gonna step in and help. That's, that's the heart of Jesus. We have to start to, to kind of slow down and noticing real needs. It's about cross-carrying. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, pick up the cross every day and follow me. And there's a beautiful line in the song that we just heard sung about, you know, the fact that he's given his life. Nothing's a sacrifice. If I realize you've already given your life for me, Jesus. And so we say, I carry the cross. I serve Jesus. It happens in our home. The toughest place for most Christians to serve is in their home. You get home after doing, you're in school all day or you're working all day, you're doing something, you're going, 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 you come home, it's like, now I can just relax, be self-centered, and be me. It's like, no. And what, about, what if you serve there? Looking for, it's this great laboratory for learning to serve everywhere else. So start in your home and look for those opportunities. Serve each other as best you can. It's a neighbor thing. Humble services, looking at your neighbors. In this crazy time of our world right now, where everyone's kind of disconnected. And trying to reconnect and say, how can I serve you? How can I help you? And to show the presence of Jesus. It's connected to your church family. Part of serving is being part of a family. You know, wh- why could Shoreline Church, right in the middle of COVID, we had one quarter where we served over 10,100 people here on our campus, food, for over 10,000 people. How'd that happen? We only have one staff person that works with that ministry, and they don't spend all their time on that one ministry. You know how it happened? Hundreds of hours of you, God's people, showing up here and preparing food, bagging food, organizing food, driving it to other places, handing bags of food out, praying for people, offering Bibles to people. Hundreds of hours of humble service, and that changed our relationship with this community. There's people that were touched during COVID that were touched by Shoreline more than anywhere else because you served humbly. It's the church together serving Jesus. And when we do that, when we look at Jesus as the humble servant, when we begin to become like Jesus and live it out, then the light starts to shine into the world. So the third movement is we learn from Jesus, we go to serve, and then as we live that out in the world, it impacts people. The question is, how does humble service open the doors of heaven? How is it that humbly serving actually opens the doors of heaven and shines the light of Jesus in the world? Well, I'm going to read a passage from Matthew chapter 5. As I'm reading this, I'm going to invite my wife to come up here and join me. She's going to share a story uh, that I believe will touch your hearts. Jesus says these words in the Sermon on the Mount, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it up on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. Listen to this. In the same way, let your light shine before others. That they may see your good deeds. Listen to this. They may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You get it? They see your humble service and God gets the glory. It's amazing to think that as a follower of Jesus, as his disciples, that we are the light of the world. And it's through our humble acts of service that we get to shine his light. Now here's a hard reality, and I live with it every day of my life, is that I tend to be selfish. And so for me, a practice that has been a part of my life for years and continues to to this day, is the minute I wake up, the second I wake up and I know I'm going to get out of bed, is I begin to say a prayer. It's not a long prayer. It's just a short prayer, giving the day to the Lord, but asking him to open up my eyes to see opportunities to share about his love and then to empower me because I can't do it in my own strength. And so a couple of years ago, Kevin and I had opportunity to serve uh, at a place, Taronga, a city um, in New Zealand. And um, it was a particular day that we had a day off. But I started my day off just like I do every day of my life, 
asking the Lord to give me open eyes to see, letting him know that even as we sang in that song, um, the offering song, I am available, that I prayed that prayer that morning. Well, the day went on, and towards the early evening, I decided to take a walk along the ocean, the coast of the ocean there. When I was coming back, um, to my surprise, there was this beautiful lit cruise ship going on the right side. And so I took a moment, and I was kind of enjoying the moment, and I noticed there weren't other people around. It was really quiet. And as I'm walking along, looking at the cruise ship, I hear this weird noise. And so I turn to my right, and to my surprise, I see two elderly women who, are, who have fallen, and they're both kind of sprawled on the ground. So I quickly run over to them, and um, there was a little bit of a hill, and so I helped them up. And they began to share with me that this was a big adventure for them in their kind of retirement home, that they had gotten permission to take the car because they knew the cruise ship was coming. And uh, one seemed kind of hurt, but um, I said, you know, I'd love to take you to your car. And they said, no, we, we've got to go see the cruise ship. This is why we've come. So I said, well, I will take, uh, I'll go with you. So I took the two ladies. We, we went up the small hill, and there we stood with one woman on the right and one woman on the left, and a friendship began. And we were just talking and enjoying the scenery. And I found out that one of the ladies was 84 and the other lady was 87. I was looking for opportunities because I felt like God had put me in this place. But the older lady seemed to be a little bit um, resistant. I could tell where she was kind of at with her faith walk. And so I just thought, you know, this is just a, a time for me to just love on them. And so I... After we were done, I brought them back to the car, and the 87-year-old woman, I knew that she needed help to get in the car. And as I'm helping her and I'm putting her into the car, the Holy Spirit prompts me to pray for her. Now, this is why my prayer is so important in the morning, because my thought is, I don't think she will like that. <laughs> and, but it's the Holy Spirit stirring me. So I'm like, okay, I need to have courage to do this. So I said to her, I said, would you mind if I prayed for you? She hesitated, and that just confirmed what I thought about her. But I knew what was going on in her mind. Well, she's been so nice to me. How can I say no? So here was my chance to, to give her some of God's power and presence right there in that moment through praying for her. And so I began to pray, and I thanked God that I had met them. I asked God to heal her, as I, I think she kind of hurt a rib. And, um, and then I began to pray, and I said, Lord, let my new friend know that the reason I was there was because you love her so very much and you sent your son Jesus for her. When I was done with my prayer, she smiled at me um, and, um, and I, got, I got away from the car and started toward the other woman and she kind of grabbed me really tight and she whispered in my ears, thank you so very much, I'm a Christian too. And I realized in that moment that was a part of what God was doing and showing his love, particularly to this 87-year-old woman. Tomorrow, when you wake up, or maybe you're in to your day a couple of hours, if the Holy Spirit reminds you of my illustration and my encouragement to you to pray, ask the Lord to give you open eyes to see opportunities to humbly serve. And then ask him to empower you. Let him know you don't have what it takes, but you know that he has what it takes and that you are available and willing. We are the light of the world. And when light appears, darkness disappears. Amen. There was somebody singing in a class I taught recently here at Shoreline, and they saw Sherry after I taught the class, and they said, I was just in a class that your husband taught. He's really crazy about you, you know? And Sherry said, I know. 
but I am. I'm very thankful that my wife and I have the privilege of serving Jesus together. And it, he says, is it just that easy? Just being available, just saying yes, it really is. And then you let God take it from there. You let God fill you and lead you. So as, you, as we think about how we're light in the world, how we go out into the world, here's just a few things to, to understand as you walk into the world, knowing that Jesus humbly served, receiving his gift of service on the cross, seeking to become a servant, and then living it in the world. Here's one thing we need to understand. That humble service reveals the heart and the presence of Jesus. When you serve people with the right heart, with a humble heart, you show the presence of Jesus. You show the heart of Jesus. It becomes a witness to the world because people are watching Christians and we're supposed to look like our Savior. And when we do, it sends a message. Humble service causes people to ask, why? People ask the question, why? When we serve with humility, people wonder, what's going on? People ask the question, why? In the last couple of years, I've seen two different movies about two different people, actually a husband and wife. Uh, one named Richard Wormbrand and one named Sabina Wormbrand, his wife. And this is a picture of them. Richard lived to be 97 years old. Sabina lived to be 90, 94 years old. And, and this husband and wife were not believers when they, became, when they were married. They both came to faith in Jesus. They both began living for Jesus. And they lived through some of the most terrible times in the history of our world. Uh, they lived through, through uh, in Romania when communism took over in Romania. And at that time, Richard was a pastor. And they had a son. Richard spent 15 years in prison. And I think, I think it was three of those years were in solitary confinement. In those 15 years of imprisonment, he was beaten and tortured almost daily. In 1966, he stood before the U.S. Senate and, gave, and talked about what had happened and actually took his shirt off and they saw the scars all over his upper body that he bore the rest of his life. But he wouldn't give up on Jesus. Sabina spent three years in prison. And when she was in, in prison, their child was, their son was left on the streets to fend for himself when she was gone in prison. Sabina saw her parents, two of her sisters, and one of her brothers killed in Nazi concentration camps. They went through com communism. They stood for their faith against Nazism. And they served the very people who oppressed them. In the, in the movie about Sabina Wormbrand's life, and I, I'm actually, I'm hoping to show that movie here sometime at Shoreline in the worship center because the producer and director is a dear friend of mine and Sherry's, and I want to bring him here to share with you the, that story and watch the movie together and then talk about it together. But, but she loved and cared for people uh, who were Nazis and shined the light of Jesus in their lives. And they asked her again and again and again, why would you love us with what all we've done to you? And the answer was always the same. I serve in the name of the one who served me. I love in the name of the one who loved me. And she would tell people about Jesus. And when Richard Wormbrand was in prison, there was one, there was one part in his story where one of the guards was literally just growing tired of and weary of beating him because every time he would be in his cell, he would kneel down to pray. And every time he, he would pray, they would beat him. And there was one time where this man came in and said, why do you keep praying? What are you praying about that's so important? And Richard Wormbrand said to him, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you that you would know the love of God. And he was. And this guard had to beat him again. But he kept praying. When you serve humbly, hopefully none of us will have to go to that place of service. But when you serve people who don't serve you, when you serve people sometimes who don't like you, when you serve some people who dislike you or treat you badly, you reflect the love and the presence of Jesus. That's the journey of humble service. Humble service turns our homes into a lighthouse. When we share the things we have with others, it shines the light of Jesus. When we serve each other in our home and people see that, it shines and shows the presence of Jesus. Humble service in your neighborhood, in your home, shows the presence of Jesus. When you make your time and your abilities available to others, it shines the light of Jesus. When you offer prayer for people in your neighborhood, in your community, it shows the presence of Jesus. So serve humbly in your home. Humble service turns our workplace or our school, if you're a student, into a mission trip. Do you know that every day you go to work, every day you go to school, you can just say, I'm on another mission trip. People go, well, I've got to spend lots of money. I've got to fly across the world to go on a mission trip. That's great. I mean, Tom, you've been to India a lot of times. It's powerful. But you know what? You don't have to get on a plane to do a mission trip. Your school, your middle school campus, your high school campus, your college campus, your workplace, that's a mission trip. And so when you go into those places, Say, God, use me. Let me serve. 
Just, just doing our work well and with excellence shows the presence of Jesus. It starts there. How about this? When you're at work, and you're, if, you, if you clock in and clock out, when you clock out, stay for five or ten more minutes and help somebody else with their work. It'll blow people's minds. I mean, the minute you clock out, you're gone. I mean, I'm not getting paid anymore. But what if you just, if you're done working, but you're not done because you're serving in the name of Jesus? It would say something. When you see a need in the workplace, you can step in and help. When you see there's, there's a gap, and, and right now in our world, there's so many gaps in the workplace. If you are in retail, service industry, um, agricultural, almost anywhere, people are understaffed. What if Christians started noticing, well, there's a gap there, and just said, can I step in and help with that? That will shine the light of Jesus. And when people ask, why? Why would you do that? You can tell them about the one who gave everything for you. Humble service adds purpose to our play. When you're having fun, when, you're just, when you get a break, you're relaxing, you're doing something fun. You say, can I serve? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm relaxing now. It's me time. Even then, look for opportunities. If you're a golfer and somebody is, is play, having a rough run and they end up in a sand trap, and maybe they're in the sand trap and then they hit out of the sand trap and they go in another sand trap. You know, you go, oh, you just want to be quiet and just kind of look away, you know. And so what if you walk over and say, well, I'll, I'll rake this trap so you can go take care of your business over that sand trap, you know. Be, call it coast to coast, beach to beach, right? But you go, you say, okay, and, and you say, well, let, let me rake this for you. So that's not that big of a thing. No, it's not, but it stands out. Humble acts of service. You're playing tennis. Somebody hits a shot and it's up over the fence. And you go, oh, I'll go get that. And just, 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 can I help? Can I serve? And when that becomes part of your life, it shines the light and the presence of Jesus. If you, if you uh, are, if there's a place where you play, where you're, you know, if, you're, if you're part of a group or association or a, or a club or anything like that, and they say, well, we're looking for people to be on the board. You go, I'm not doing that. All right? A couple years ago, we've been living where we live for 13 years. A couple years ago, at our HOA, they, were, they couldn't get people to be on the board. And everything inside of me was like, I don't, I mean, it can be political. And it's good, and I don't, I don't want to do this. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, Kevin, say yes. I said, oh, I, I kind of lied. I'd love to be on the board. I said something like that. <laughs> but I said, you know, but I said, sure, you know. It, it, it changes your life as you learn to say yes when the Lord prompts you and guides you, even in your fun, even in your play. Maybe in the, what you do for fun, you're good at something. Maybe, maybe you know, you're, you're into riding horses or you're into some sport and you can help someone else. Maybe, maybe you're on a sports team as a young person and there's somebody else who come on the team and they're not as good. Instead of competing against them, what do you say? Well, let me, hey, actually, if you did this or this and just give them a little coaching, give them a little bit of help, that's humble service. It's living like Jesus wherever we go. And humble service turns the church into a healing center. When God's people in the church serve, and you, and you can serve in your home, you can serve in your neighborhood, you can serve in the community, but also I would encourage you, if you're part of this church or part of a local church somewhere else, serve at your church. Find a place to engage. And as people are starting to, and I'm, now every week I'm meeting people that are coming up to me and saying, we're back. We've been online for the last two years. We, and I have people say, we're online every week, we love it, but we're back now. And so as people are starting to, as you're able to, and be back more engaged here on campus, we need more people engaged serving with children's ministry, serving with youth ministry, greeters and ushers, and just, just saying, is there a place I can serve? I encourage people, if you want to have a great Sunday morning of worship, I encourage you to do this. Attend one and serve one. We have services at 9 and 11. Come to, you know, so I'll come to 9 o'clock and come to church, and I'll kind of hang out, and then I'll help with children at 11 o'clock. I'll come at, I'll come at 9 o'clock, and I'll help in hospitality, get all the food ready. It means coming early. And, I'll, and, I'll go, and, then, and then I'll go to worship at the later service. But, but say, if I can serve in my church, it helps our church become an, an impactful agent of change in our world and shows the light of Jesus around our community. You can serve during the week around Shoreline Church. You can be engaged in our, our community outreach and our global outreach. And we're now starting to get to the point where we're dreaming and looking at, Pastor Ben's leading us in this, we're dreaming, okay, how are we going to now go out more to the world? For the last two years, everything's been shut down, but as soon as things are open, we want to go out and be the church in the world. He said, I'd love to be part of that. So today, I want to encourage you, if, after, if you're on campus after the service, go out in the courtyard, and there's those two tents right next to each other, right kind of between the, the stairs there, and they'll, they'll talk to you about what's happening in the life of Shoreline, where we need people to get involved in serving. If you're online, just go on the website and click where it says information about serving. And maybe you don't, don't, can't do it right now, but maybe this week, pull up the website and say, what are opportunities to serve? And there's so many ways that you could, that you could discover your abilities, discover your gifts. And, and, and like I said earlier, Sherry's leading a class today on discovering your spiritual gifts and how to use those for the glory of Jesus. 
So the last thought. Living like Jesus brings Jesus to a world that wonders. When you live like Jesus, when you humbly serve like Jesus, you're bringing Jesus to a world that wonders, are you Christians serious about your faith? I mean, you Christians say you follow Jesus. Do you look like Jesus? Do you think like Jesus? Do you love like Jesus? Do you serve like Jesus? And one of the best ways to let your light shine is by serving like Jesus served. By saying, God, I'm available. And then when God gives you an opportunity, you say that one word, yes. And you step into it. You live into it. God, this is our prayer today. That we would raise our hand, whether it's in our heart, we're actually raising our hand and saying, Lord, I'm available. I want to serve. This day, if you show me an opportunity, I will serve in the name of Jesus. And then, Lord, when the opportunity comes, may we say yes. Help us to serve in our homes, in our neighborhood, in our social settings. Help us serve in your church and all around our community. And may the light and the love of Jesus shine and flow freely through the service of your people. We pray this in your name and for your glory. Amen. Before I dismiss you and send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give a couple final invitations. If you want to spend time and have someone pray for you, we have people up in the front here. If you're on campus, come in the worship center up front and there's teams ready to pray for you. If you're online, you can send an email with your prayer need or call the number on the screen and someone's waiting to answer that phone and pray, pray with you there. If you're new at Shoreline and you're on campus, just go right into the Connection Center, right inside the doors into the lobby there and you'll see the Connection Center. They want to give you a gift and a thank you for coming and a warm personal welcome. And if you're online and you're new, just text the word welcome to the number you see right there on your screen and we will follow up with you. If you are on campus or online and you want a copy of the Organic Disciples book that we're going through together, we want everyone to have a copy. If you want to get one, come during the week. If you're online or here, go by the Connection Center. If you want a copy, we want one for, we've got one for everybody. If you can afford to pay the cost on it, feel free to pay. If you can't afford, feel free to pick up a book. If you've got extra and want to pay for an extra book, you can cover an extra book and that'll be for somebody else. But we want everyone to walk through that together and let's keep learning together as we look at that. If you want to discover your spiritual gifting, uh, right up these stairs, or you can go around up the stairs out there, uh, up in the garden room, starting in just a few minutes, will be a spiritual gifts class, 45 minutes. And also you'll do a survey to learn about uh, how God's gifted and made you to serve him. And then finally, if you say, I want to take a next step, go by the courtyard or go online and see what's happening at Shoreline. Just say, Lord, I'm available. And when something strikes your heart and the Holy Spirit says, this one's for you, step in and see what God does. And again, when I asked Tom and Jill that 13 to 20,000 hours, whatever it is that you've served, would they take one hour back? They said, no, not one hour. Because that is service that's impacted the world for the gospel. If you're able to stand, will you stand with me? If you're online, if you're able to stand, let's stand together and let me just send you off with a word of blessing. As we close our time together, will you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus? Will you see his humble service? from foot washing to caring for the little children to hanging on a cross to cooking lunch for some hungry disciples after they go fishing? And then will you seek to serve like Jesus? And when someone asks you why, tell them about the one who has served you and who you love. God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you back together next Sunday morning. Have a great week.